Piero di Cosimo altarpiece, Virgin and Child, with St. Vincent Ferrer's on your left and St. Jerome on your right, entered the Yale University Art Gallery collection in 1871. The painting was commissioned from Piero around 1510 by the flagellant Compagnia di San Vincenzo Ferreri for an altar dedicated to the saint in Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Originally, the altarpiece was much larger and two sets of angels stood above the holy figures as shown in this hypothetical reconstruction by Elizabeth Walmsley. At some point before James Jackson Jarvis acquired the painting around 1859, the altarpiece was cut into three paintings. A 1916 photograph documents that large areas of the altarpiece were repainted to modify the composition and conceal areas of damages. In an effort to remove these restoration, an attempt to clean the painting was initiated by Andrew Petrin in 1957 and halted in 1959. Between the 1950s to the 1970s, over 200 early Italian paintings at Yale were systematically and indiscriminately cleaned or half cleaned. Original artist materials, damages, and later additions were identified. Modern additions deemed to falsify the original painted surface were removed, and the paintings were displayed in a fragmentary state with all damages exposed. This purist archaeological approach, guided by the search for authenticity, gave no consideration to the aesthetic and visual unity of the picture surfaces and the historic importance of previous restorations. The altarpiece was left partially cleaned in 1959. The past treatment methodology needed to be thoughtfully and critically engaged when planning the current treatment. This presentation will focus first on the restoration history of the altarpiece and secondly on the current cleaning treatment. The restoration history of the altarpiece can be traced through documents and photographs. This photo of 1895 published by William Rankin records an early alteration to the altarpiece when a star was added to St. Vincent Ferrer's halo, transforming him into St. Dominic. Giovanni Cinelli's 1677 tourist guide mentions St. Dominic and references the pairs of standing angels holding books above the holy figures, indicating that the saint's identity change occurred prior to 1677. Between 1677 and 1859, the painting was cut and the top of the central panel was rounded to an arch. The gap the angels once occupied were filled with wooden inserts painted to suggest a continuation of the sky. In 1915, the painting was treated by Hammond Smith. A comparison between the 1895 and the 1916 photographs illustrate minor changes in the general appearance of the painting, leaving large areas of restoration intact, except for the removal of the star. Other documented modifications include a cradle attached in 1931 and Andrew Petrin's cleaning in 1957. In this comparison, it is apparent that ex the extent of old restoration campaigns and the incomplete nature of the 1950s cleaning, which left large portions of old restorations unevenly distributed across the painting. The restorations can be categorized into two groups, those that aim to refresh and alter the surviving imagery and those that concealed areas of damages and repairs. In the first group, and they're highlighted in red, the restorations are a dull gray and dark brown overpaint which covers the pedestal of the throne on the left side of St. Vincent Ferrer, as well as comprise the reworking of St. Jerome's robe and portions of the background. The overpaint on the pedestal covered a light color resembling a, light, um, a pink marble. The molding visible in the center of the top step was extended uh, to the left. An opaque gray overpaint obscured St. Jerome's translucent purple robe and folds were altered and the fabric extended to cover the saint's leg. The overpaint immobilized the saint. 
As originally, he is depicted actively stepping forward. This overpaint, as you can see, was partially removed by Petrin. In the background, portions of the buildings and trees behind St. Vincent were added and revisited after completion of the painting. The second group of restorations was intended to conceal extensive areas of damages and thus improve the aesthetics of the composition. Examples are found in several areas. First, in the sky, which was repainted in a cooler blue and was extended on the upper new additions. Secondly, in the faces of the two saints and the head of the lion, which were simultaneously repaired and reworked, accentuating the features and expressions. This overpaint was for the most part removed by Petrin. And finally, on the six of the seven seams between the panels and the foreground, which was extensively repainted. In the 1916 photo, which you see the black and white, the foreground is decorated with 15 scattered flowers, eight of which were added by a later hand, and several of which were reinforced with extra petals and leaves. The 1950s treatment removed the added flowers and partially cleaned the reinforced foliage, but failed to clean a, fat, a flat, homogeneous layer of chalky green overpaint and the pigmented coatings below. Petrin listed the solutions and solvents he used in a brief condition report. Nafta, triple distilled turpentine, xylene, acetone, morpholine, and dimethyl formamide. Signs of damages related to aggressive past cleaning treatment include marks from scraping tools, striations from rough sandpaper-like material, and abrasions from soft and eroded edges caused by strong alkaline solvents. You're not going to see anything here. In this second part of the presentation, I will present our cleaning methodology, which was guided by a few principles. The work of art is a unique creation distinguished by its own history, physically recorded on the art object. Conservators and curators look at each historical passage and negotiate their retention, removal, or partial removal. This process is based on a variety of criteria, including the desire to improve the legibility of the image. The aesthetic and cultural background of the conservators and curator impact their visual perception of the work. In this treatment, the fundamental theoretical and practical principle of conservation were challenged by the visual disorder of the painting. Different types of restoration materials competed with each other, and the contrast between the cleaned and unclean sections were disturbing. The material characteristics of the altarpiece pose many challenges to the cleaning. The very delicate original paint lacks the hard qualities of an oil-based paint film. Through empirical observation, it has been found that the paint film is softer than what would we expect of an oil paint of this age. Softening of dry oil-based paint layers can be attributed to saponification when soaps or salt of fatty acids are formed by the hydrolysis of ester linkages and triglycerides under alkaline or acid conditions. During the long history of the painting, it was likely subjected to multiple cleaning campaigns using alkaline solutions. Chain scissors during the aging of paint film can also lead to the formation of low molecular weight compounds, such as the azelaic acid, which can plasticize and soften the paint film. The plasticization of aged oil paint film can also be caused by the use of non-volatile solvents, like those used by Petrin and wax-based consolidants. Sizable cl clusters of paint blisters containing beeswax, as identified with FTIR and PyGCMS, have been found on the whole painting and indicate a consolidation treatment. This image of a cross section removed from an edge of a blister in a multi layer paint area shows that the wax is visible between the imprimatura and the ground layer. You can see it. It's we believe that the consolidant was heated at high temperature and pressed down with an iron in order for it to penetrate into the paint, which caused it to blister. 
The impact of the wax consolidation treatment on the paint layer structure is illustrated in cross sections removed from areas without blisters. Cross section 12 was prepared from the foreground and the relatively simple original layer structure was consistent with the stratigraphy observed in other areas. The gypsum base ground layer was followed by a medium rich preparatory layer which appears white or translucent in visible dark field illumination and which has strong outer fluorescence under ultraviolet illumination. The simprimatura layer consists of a mixture of lead white and a drying oil. Elemental analysis, mapping, and infrared spectra indicated a composition gradient across this layer. Which you can see right there. Across this layer, there is a higher concentration of lead white particles at the top of the layer relative to a drying oil component and a lower concentration of lead white at the bottom. There's some indication from infrared spectra that the application of this imprimatura started with a layer of drying oil that penetrated and sealed the ground layer. The imprimatura layer is followed by a drying oil-based paint layer. In this cross-section, it consists primarily of a lead-white pigment matrix with few red lake pigment particles, coarse carbon black, dark iron oxide pigments, and a few silica and aluminosilicate particles. Darkened varnish and pigmented layers follow. The size of the altarpiece and the extent of the overpaint requires multiple conservators to work at once. This presented concerns about the consistency of the cleaning, resolved by continually evaluating our practice and adjusting our aesthetic in order to achieve a uniformity in cleaning levels. These challenges and restrictions posed by the painting's history and condition, as well as the painting's sheer size, structured our treatment framework. The cleaning process began with careful observation of the paint surface in normal and UV light, X-radiograph, infrared, reflectography, and cross-sections. After long deliberation, it was decided with the curator to focus the initial cleaning on four areas. The seams, the far left portion of the throne's pedestal behind St. Vincent Ferrer, and the foreground. The upper 19th century additions were removed in order to present the painting as a large fragment of an altarpiece. The painting was first surface cleaned. Over time, six of the seven seams have opened, causing cracks and losses in the ground and paint layer. The misaligned planks have small steps between them, and fills and retouching were applied to compensate, covering large portion of the original paint. Cleaning along the seams was initiated because the retouching was discolored and, th discolored and thick, visually dividing the surface in vertical section and interrupting the composition. Initial solubility testing indicated that the oil-based restoration were partially soluble in mixtures of polar solvents. A number of polar solvents, both in free solvent solutions and in gels, were tested. The most successful was an acetone benzyl alcohol gel. The gel was applied on the surface with a small sable brush and left to work for roughly a minute. The gel was then removed with a dry swab and the area cleared with a one-to-one -one solution of isopropanol and shell sol mineral spirit. After two to three gel applications, any remaining residues were removed mechanically. The exposed gessophils were softened with a water and oil emulsion and then reduced with a scalpel. In other areas of the painting, where thick layers of overpaint and pigmented coatings were present, such as in the foreground, the pedestal, and St. Jerome's robe, the gel system developed for removal of the paint was not effective. I will now describe the cleaning protocols developed for these areas, first the pedestal and second the foreground in detail. To understand the properties and apparent insolubility of both the pigmented coatings and overpaint layers, FTIR and PyGCMS analysis were complete employed. All coatings and overpaint samples contain drying oil and in one varnish sample pine resin was found. 
This confirmed the initial observations. The pigmented coating felt like a possible mixture of resin, oil, and pigments. The IR spectra of two pigmented layers indicated the presence of calcite, in one case together with basic lead carbonate. Overpaint layers contain lead white and in one instance bone black. Infrared spectra also indicated the presence of metal salts of carboxylates, which likely formed in the varnish and overpaint layers due to the reaction between the pigments and the drying oil. The low solubility of these compounds in organic solvents added to the challenge of separating the oil-based contain coatings from the original oil-based paint layer. In the winter of 2014, the Conservation Department consulted Richard Walbers on the development of a cleaning system for the altarpiece. During the workshop, a variety of xanthan gum emulsions specifically tailored for the requirements of the altarpiece were prepared. As we heard from Richard and Chris, xanthan gum is an ideal emulsifying solvent carrier because it can carry a wide range of solvents and chelating materials and remain in a gel form at a wide range of pH values. A xanthan gel at a concentration of 1 to 2 percent can be easily picked up with a brush applied on the surface and delicately agitated. It can then be removed with a dry swab. The area is cleared first with a solution of water and then with mineral spirit. In the left portion of the throne's pedestal, two layers of overpaint were present. A thick light gray overpaint lies directly on the original pink paint layer and in the lower section a dark brown layer was below the gray overpaint. The brown layer extends on the razor step directly on the original paint layer which is protected by a thin and uneven layer of old but not original varnish. The cleaning started at the top edge of the pedestal where the original paint film was visible and progressed towards the lower edge. Though the acetone benzyl alcohol gel was useful in softening the top layer of gray overpaint, the lower brown layer was more resilient. For this layer, different emulsions were prepared from a 2% stock gel of xanthan gum and deionized water. By varying the three key elements, adjusting the pH, changing the chelating agent, and altering the concentration of the emulsified solvent, the gels were modified to the solubility parameters of the brown layer. Five different emulsions were prepared from a pH of 6 to a pH of 10. Three emulsions containing 5, 10, and 15 percent concentration of benzyl alcohol were prepared for each gel at a specific pH value. The different gels were used according to the thickness and composition of the overpaint needed to be removed. A xanthan gum emulsion with H. HETTA at a pH of 10 containing 15% of benzyl alcohol was the most successful in reducing the oil base brown layer. As the removal progressed closer to the uneven varnish of the original surface, on the original surface, a weaker xanthan gum emulsion with citric acid at a pH of 7 was used. The benzyl alcohol concentration varied according to the thickness of the overpaint and sensitivity of the original paint. Any remaining overpaint residues were removed mechanically in order to preserve the thin old layer of varnish. This image of a drop of a xanthan gum emulsion on the surface of the painting shows the even distribution of the suspended immiscible solvent. The emulsified solvent is applied on the surface of the painting with a modified sable brush size double zero. The brush is shaved to an angle to increase both rigidity and traction on the overpaint. The emulsion on the surface is gently agitated with the brush in circular and rolling motions so the solvent comes in contact with the surface. The gel becomes cloudier with removed pigment particles. The time of contact changes depending on the area, but does not exceed one minute. All operations are monitored under a microscope. 
The scalpel blades used for mechanical cleaning were sharpened and shaped according to the paint topography. The reduction of the overpaint is improved by wetting it with mineral spirits, reducing the traction between the restoration materials and the sharp metal. The mineral spirits also saturate the surface, clarifying different physical and optical qualities of the original and restoration materials. The foreground is a complex stratification of uneven and disrupted layers of overpaint and pigmented coatings. Here, the fragility of the paint layer and its uneven state of preservation are particularly evident. After initial solubility tests, the cleaning protocol developed for the foreground followed a parallel, though modified, process as the protocol for the pedestal. The top layer of chalky light green over paint was removed easily with the acetone benzyl alcohol gel, exposing an uneven distributed gray over paint and a pigmented oil resin coating. So this is the green chalk and this is the gray over paint. The gray over paint lies directly on the original colors in some areas and on the pigmented oil resin coatings in others. An unevenly distributed old varnish is present below these areas. The gray overpaint was most reduced with the xanthan gum emulsion at a pH of seven, at pHs of seven and eight. The process of xanthan gel application differs across the foreground color in response to the condition of the paint film and physical qualities of the restoration layers. In the foreground, the original paint layer is soft and fragile and more stable in others, while texture also change from smooth to rich. Brush stroke um, has been eroded by the use of strong solvent as well as abrasive material. The xanthan gum gel with a 15% benzyl alcohol is applied to the restoration coatings in the same manner described above. Mechanical cleaning, however, is employed more frequently than in the pedestal because of, its, because of the sensitivity of the original paint layer. These are RTI images of um, a cleaning in progress. Where the gray thick overpaint is present, the gel is worked into the surface for a longer amount of time. The binding medium is softened and solubilized, and the large pigment particles of the overpaint are picked up by the emulsion. Physically working the gel into the surface allows the suspended solvent droplets to establish a continuous contact, which varies in each application. The action of the brush impacts the effectiveness of the gel. Each physical motion with the brush refreshes the action of the emulsion by bringing new micelles in contact with the surface. Particularly thick areas of overpaint can require multiple gel applications. When the overpaint is thin, the cleaning becomes more tactile. The weight of the scalpel handle, the shape blade, the circular motions, and different levels of pressure of the hand allow the softened material to be shaved. All cleaning requires the use of the microscope. In regards to the old varnish, unevenly distributed, the scalpel is the primary tool used for thinning it down, and the gel is not usually applied. When the cleaning process is finished, the paint film is left protected by an uneven thin layer of varnish. The ongoing cleaning of the Piero di Cosimo altarpiece has unveiled extensive areas of original intact paint. While some revealed areas are better preserved than others, the cleaning is raising the legibility of the image to new levels of comprehension and enabling new insight into the process of the painting's manufacture. The restoration of Piero di Cosimo's altarpiece has a pedagogical component. Several interns and fellows have had the opportunity to participate in the treatment. Within the minds of the conservators involved, visual recordings of the restoration coatings and of the original painted surface coexist 
with the practical muscle memories of the cleaning action. These recording influence motor learning. Through practice of varied but similar motions and adaptation, an archive of tactile skills is recorded. Those skills will crucially inform the present and future choices of materials and methods. All collaborators have developed the ability to coordinate and compensate for different hands, cleaning approaches, and inherent subjectivities in order to obtain a balanced solution. When restoration is understood as a continuous revealing process of an active critical work, the work of art becomes the source of our knowledge. Thank you. So, um, um, I wanted to thank Richard Walbers for coming and helping, and also the fellows and interns that have worked on this altarpiece, Carlos Moya, who is a graduate of the Winter Tour program, and um, Kristen Egan and um, Annika Finn, who are graduate pro of the NYU program. I think it's really good that we sort of cite them.